Hello everybody, Step here from Gathering Information, back for the third in this series of the Commander 2018 Unboxing, Review, and Analysis. And this week we have, for your perusal, Subjective Reality, commanded by the eminently creepy Aminato, the Fate Shifter. First we're going to unbox the deck, then we're going to lay out the deck, and then we're going to go through the deck in detail and compare it to the other Esper colored deck that was released in the 2013 Commander series. So let's jump right in. All right, so here we are with Commander, Subjective Reality. Join the fray. Choose blah, 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 blah. Same as all the others so far. However, Subjective Reality. Aminato may be a child, but she possesses the wisdom of many lifetimes, and the power to manipulate reality itself. She can effortlessly alter a person's entire destiny for better or worse, and leave no trace of her interference. Wonder how she'd deal with Jace. Uh, this has the deck box, the hundred card deck, and the ten tokens, plus the final commander, whatever. We'll, we'll get into it. Let's hear this now. And, uh, speaking of the foil oversized commander, get rid of that, and pull this out. Let's see what Aminato can do. Esper for her casting cost for a legendary planeswalker, Aminato. Three loyalty, plus one, draw a card, then put a card from your hand on top of your library. Minus one, exile another target permanent you own, then return it to the battlefield under your control. And then minus six, choose left or right. Each player gains control of all non-land permanents other than Aminato, the Fate Shifter, controlled by the next player in the chosen direction. <laughs> Got a little... Uh, out of focus there at the end. All right, so open the deck box. These are beautiful. I wish they were, I don't know, big enough to hold a sleeved deck. All right, so we've got the insert. Let's skip to the insert. All right, let's start by reading about the creepy child. Uh, we've got Aminato, the Fate Shifter. Though she is only eight years old, Aminato possesses the knowledge of lifetimes and a supernatural attunement to the tapestry of fate. She can foresee the branching consequences of the smallest actions, twists, uh, twist destiny with barely a thought, and perhaps even unmake the multiverse itself. Fortunately, Though she has the curiosity and caprice of a child, she usually limits herself to minor manipulations of fate in service of her whims and desires. Sounds like a powerful presence for the multiverse, but specifically commander powerful. I doubt we'll see her in the main storyline anytime soon. However, there are three other characters who may... Um, be worth introducing ourselves to. This interesting looking Sphinx lady is Yannette, the cryptic sovereign. Most Sphinxes live in solitude, keeping their esoteric wisdom and arcane insights to themselves. Yannette is not most Sphinxes. Knowledge is power, she believes, and she has used that power to become a queen. Her magic snatches moments from the future and pulls them into the present. That is really cool. And finally, for commanders of the deck, we have this mummy-looking person. Who is this? Varina, the Lich Queen. Varina's necromantic magic has preserved her semblance of life for countless centuries and made the passage of time meaningless to her. She can peer into a range of unfulfilled futures and raise zombies from the shadows of these discarded realities. Wow, what a cool concept. She's not making zombies from corpses. She's pulling, like, matter through without the substance of thought? Interesting. 
So those are the three possible commanders for the deck, but there's one more legendary creature who can be introduced on these um, in this context. We've got Yuriko, the Tiger's Shadow. On the plane of Kamigawa, the identity of the Tiger's Shadow is a mystery, but the monstrous face of the mask she wears inspires hope among the weak and terror in the mighty. She wields secrets as a weapon to debase the powerful and bring aid to the oppressed and afflicted. The thing I like about all four of these characters, as they've been described, is that they're not evil. Uh, Kamigawa had blue and black as the, um, the kind of good colors. So did Kaladesh, come to think of it. Black was definitely mostly on the side of the good guys, black and red, whereas blue and white were the, um, were, were the bad guys. They were the consul. They were the authority. In the case of Yennet, I don't think there's any problem with being a queen, and um, Aminato seems to enjoy just learning and being inventive. So we'll see how that bears out on their cards, but for now let's check out what the deck is actually supposed to do. All right, so Commander, Subjective Reality, Primary Commander, Aminato, the Fate Shifter, Secondary Commanders, Yenet, Cryptic Sovereign, and Verena, Lich Queen. Playing the deck, Subjective Reality is a control deck that consistently manipulates the top card of its library to create major advantages. Controlling when you draw your best cards, not to mention the power of miracles, manifests, and more gives you a strong late game that should let you outlast your foes. Each of your potential commanders offers you a different way to determine your destiny within the game. Aminato the Fate Shifter has the power to control the future, warping fate in pursuit of victory. Aminato's first ability can ensure your top card is exactly what you want, need it to be, setting up cards you'll miracle or manifest, of course, if things get out of hand, her then her ultimate ability can change the entire landscape of the battlefield. If you'd rather play more proactively with the top card of your library, then let Yenet, Cryptic Sovereign, soar into battle. This legendary Sphinx is strongest when revealing cards with odd converted mana costs from the top of your library. Use cards with the Scry ability to make sure you're revealing the right spells, and Yenet will defeat your opponents with a steady stream of free spells. Free spells are always sweet. Varina the Wit Lich Queen is suited to a more typical control game built on attrition and inevitability. This eternal master of undeath simultaneously digs for your best cards while discarding cards to fuel a zombie army. Your opponents will be hard pressed to hang tough against her endless hordes. And longer games should favor your victory. And of course we've got the rules of playing commander as well as the add material. But I really like the way these um, synopses come together. So I guess that's enough of that. Let's get back to the deck. Right, we've got the same thick commander deck, same card on the back, of course, because they expect you to only get one of these, I guess. <laughs> See if I can open it. There we go. All right, so we read through Aminato's abilities, but man, look at that pretty foil. Alright, Verena, Lich Queen. One, white, blue, black. For a legendary creature, zombie wizard, she's a 4-4. Four, four. Whenever you attack with one or more zombies, draw that many cards, then discard that many cards. You gain that much life. Sweet. Pay two and exile two cards from your graveyard. Create a tapped 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token. So if they're cards you don't want, you're drawing too much land, whatever, you can turn them into zombies. Yenet. Cryptic Sovereign is two 
white, blue, black. For a legendary creature, Sphinx, she's a 3-5 with flying, vigilance, and menace. Whenever Yennet Cryptic Sovereign attacks, reveal the top card of your library. If that card's converted mana cost is odd, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. Otherwise, draw a card. So you can cast it for free, and then you can draw a card, draw it if it you can't cast it for free. Anyway, tokens. Those are some Vestrati zombies and uh, manifests from from Tarkir. Oh, and uh, a shapeshifter looks like from um, Lorwyn. I don't know where the angels are from, but they look generically pretty. And lots of zombies, of course, because you're going to need lots of zombies. All right, so the deck. Loyal Unicorn, Loyal Subordinate. Those are two of the new ones. Geode Golem, that's another new one. So, aha, a miracle. Hmm, I wish it wouldn't focus like that. Crib Swap, that must be where the, um, uh, the shapeshifter is for. And uh, light form, that's for the manifests. Brainstorm! Cloud form, that's another manifest. Dream cache. Drawing cards, putting cards back. Oh, mull drifter. Nice. Good to flicker. Ninjas. Ponder. Portent. Predict. Sigiled starfish. Telling Time, Treasure Hunt, Esper Charm, Mortify, Azoria Signet, I imagine we'll see a couple more of those, Command Sphere of course, Crystal Ball, Demir Signet, Signet number two, Mind Stone, Orzhov Signet, Signet number three, so that's the Signets, Pilgrim's Eye, and on to Boreas Charger. That's another new one, I think. Magus of Balance. A riff on the balance art. Aminato's Augury. Primordial Mist. Ooh, that's a new miracle. Entreat the Dead. Beautiful Night Incarnate. Skull Storm. That is something. Sower of Discord. And Yuriko, the Tiger's Shadow. So Yuriko is one blue-black for a 1-3 human ninja. Let's get a better look at that, actually. She's got Commander Ninjutsu for blue and a black. Pay the cost and return an unblocked attacker you control to hand, to your hand. Put this card onto the battlefield from your hand or the command zone tapped and attacking. So if they don't block one of your creatures, huh, suddenly it's this thing. Um, and you can put it onto the command zone or onto the battlefield from the command zone or your hand. So if you choose to use this as your commander, it'll work every time. Uh, huh, that's free too of commander tax. That can be quite terrifying, but it won't work as a commander of this deck because there's no white. However, whenever a ninja you control deals combat damage to a player, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. Each opponent loses life equal to that card's converted mana cost. So we've already seen ninja of deep hours, let's see if there are any more ninjas. Isolated Watchtower, is that a new land? We'll find out. Entreat the Angels, that's what Entreat the Dead is a rift on. Sarah Avatar, Army of the Damned. Got some good ones, a Tarkar Valkyrie. Chroma's Vengeance. The OG, uh, what do you call it? Terminus, there's another miracle. Conundrum Sphinx, Devastation Tide. Man, those miracles look cool. Gin of Wishes, that is super good if you know what your top card is. Jeskai Infiltrator, Sphinx of Jawar Isle, Sphinx of Uthun, Phyrexian Delver, Aether Mage's Touch, Dusk Mantle Seer, Enigma Sphinx, Sphinx is all over the place here, High Priest of Penance for some removal, 
Silent Blade Oni. There's another ninja. Utter End. Seer's Lantern. Soul Ring. And we're into the lands now. So some planes, planes, planes. Seven, eight planes. Two, three, four, five islands. And nice swamp. Three swamps. Really? Only three swamps? Forge of Heroes. Arcane Sanctum. Azorius Chantry. The Bounce Lands. Azorius Guildgate. Baron Moor for some cycling. Command Tower. Demir Bounce Land. Demir Guildgate. Demir Life Gain. And a bunch of just random decent lands. Resolve, resolve, resolve. So I guess the Arcane Sanctum is the only tri land in the deck, but that's probably fine. Is that the only tri land that exists? We'll find out. Anyway, let's sort this thing out. And there you have it. Uh, we've got the whole deck. It looks pretty balanced. There's even a bit of a curve. Uh, although there are a lot of 2-drop and 3-drop mana rocks. So we'll have a better look at what the deck is supposed to do in just a moment. So let's start with an expanded look at the deck. We've exploded it out. We've got the creatures here from 2 to 7 drops. Non-creature permanents are mostly artifacts, and most of those are mana rocks, and then we've got the spells. This deck has a lot of spells, ranging from 1 all the way up to a 9 drop, which we might talk about later. But you can kind of see that this looks like a control deck from the very outset. It has a uh, definite curve, but with emphasis on the long game. So I don't think that we've emphasized up to this point just how useful it is to have a Planeswalker commander. Not only because they're harder to interact with for your opponents than killing your creatures, but because the abilities of the Planeswalker can more obviously and more directly relate to the plan of your deck. So let's have another look at what Aminato, the Fate Shifter, does. Plus one, draw a card, then put a card from your hand on top of your library. This is supposed to be a top of the library matters deck, and there are a bunch of ways that Aminato can make that difference. Aminato isn't the only card in the deck that lets you manipulate your top deck, though. There are a whole suite of spells, including a creature and a couple of artifacts that either let you peek, let you scry, or let you manipulate the top of your deck by drawing extra cards and then putting something back on top. Of course, manipulating the top of your library wouldn't matter so much unless you had cards to take advantage of knowing just what that top card was either by caring about what's on the top of your deck while they're on the battlefield, or by being on the top of your deck at just the right time for you to take advantage. Let's talk about the Miracles. This deck runs five Miracle cards, one of which is brand new, and the big upside of Miracles is that if you draw them, and they're the first card that you've drawn this turn, you can cast it for its Miracle cost, which is always cheaper and sometimes insanely so 
Terminus is a board wipe, which can cost single white to cast. Banishing Stroke, a removal spell, again, single white. Entreat the Angels usually costs at least five to get you a 4-4, four four. but if you miracle it, you can get three 4-4s four for the same cost. You can often miracle something and then cast another spell in the same turn, so if you are wiping the board with Terminus, you can then usually cast a creature on the same turn. So the usual downside of Wraths being so expensive you can't cast something else, leaving your opponent to cast the first creature or affect the board in the first way. With a Miracle, you can often get that leg up. Miracles aren't the only thing that cares about the top of the deck, though. We also have three enchantments, three in the deck, and they all revolve around manifesting. Now, to manifest a card, you put it onto the battlefield face down as a 2-2 creature. Turn it face up at any time for its mana cost if it's a creature card. The downside, of course, being that you might manifest your best removal spell and then it's just a stupid 2-2. Two -two. Or you might manifest a draw spell and it's just a 2-2. Two -two. Or you might manifest your mana rock. Although, if you're manifesting basic lands, you're usually pretty happy with that. However, if you know what your top deck is, and if it's a powerful creature that you can't cast yet, you can manifest it as a 2-2, and then at any time, at instant speed, mind, you can flip it up, or faster than instant speed, for its mana cost, and it'll be whatever big, excited thing it was supposed to be. Or maybe your opponent decides not to block your 2-2 because they're afraid it might have death touch, or destroy target non-land permanent. In that case, they may fall into the trap of the other sub-theme of this deck, which is ninjas, or things that have triggers when they hit your opponent, like Jeskai Infiltrator, which manifests something else when it hits your opponent, or Geode Golem, which lets you cast your commander from the command zone without paying its mana cost or any of the ninjas that have various effects, in this case mostly drawing cards, when they hit your opponent. Unblocked creatures can be very dangerous when you don't know what they are. Now the remaining major downside of manifesting something big is that it might have an enter the battlefield trigger, which you really want to trigger. Unfortunately, when you unmanifest something, it doesn't trigger its ability. It doesn't leave or enter the battlefield. However, the new enchantment Primordial Mist, which has kicked off this whole manifest thing, has an interesting ability. Exile a face-down permanent you control face up, i.e. one of your manifested cards. You can play that card this turn. This is a way to get those powerful enter the battlefield triggers, although you will have to pay for the cost of the card. So if you don't want to do that, maybe it's time to talk about Aminato the Fate Shifter's second ability, her minus one. Exile another target permanent you own, then return it to the battlefield under your control. This ability works well against mind controls. You can bounce your thing back to your control, but it's also useful in dealing with manifests with powerful enter the battlefield abilities. For instance, Sphinx of Uthun, which you may have manifested for free or for three mana if you had cloud form or light form attached to it, and can then flicker it to get the enter the battlefield ability of revealing the top five cards of your library, letting an opponent separate those into two piles, and put one of those piles into your hand, and the other in your graveyard. Or let's say you don't want to get rid of Cloud Form or Light Form. You can flicker those, and when they enter the battlefield, manifest again, leaving you with your original manifested creature, and a new one with Light Form or Cloud Form attached to it. If you want to get tricky, you can cast a spell for its evoke cost, which would normally have you sacrifice it as it enters the battlefield, but in 
response to that trigger. Flicker, the evoked creature, having it enter the battlefield as a new object and having the evoke trigger fizzle. Now, there's no way to actually do that in the precon deck. Aminato's abilities can't be activated at instant speed, but there are any number of spells in magic history that flicker at instant speed if you want to make changes to the deck. You can also use Aminatu to trigger leaves the battlefield abilities, like with Knight Incarnate. When it leaves the battlefield, all creatures get minus three, minus three until end of turn. If you've had a big combat, or if there's just a board full of little creatures, you could flicker your Knight Incarnate to give everything minus three. Another good use of flickering something is with Aether Mage's Touch. Reveal the top four cards of your library. You may put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield. It gains. At the beginning of your end step, return this creature to its owner's hand. This works with the top deck ability, but it also works with the flicker ability, because once it's on the battlefield, if you flicker the creature, it won't leave at end of turn. You can also flicker permanents to reset counters, as with Jin of Wishes, or even just untap your mana rocks, like Sol Ring, to double dip and cast something huge. And that's about it for Aminato. I don't believe the minus six will come into play that often. I think you'll just be plus oneing and minus oneing every other turn, or um, maybe plus plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, that kind of thing. And that's it. That's the majority of the deck. Now, let's see how this compares to the other Esper-colored control deck that was released for Commander 2013. Eternal Bargain, starring Aloro, Ageless Ascetic, as its commander. He was three white, blue, black for a legendary creature, Giant Soldier. He was a 4-5, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you gain two life. Whenever you gain life, you may pay one colorless. If you do, draw a card, and each opponent loses one life. Now, obviously, all that can only happen when he's on the battlefield, but at the beginning of your upkeep, if Aloro Ageless Ascetic is in the command zone, you gain two life. So this was sort of a precursor to um, Eminence ability from last year's Commander series, but basically... His whole deck was revolving around you gaining life and then using your life as a resource. So let's look at the deck. Right away you can see that this is a control curve. The creatures, fully half, cost 5 mana or more. Moving on, we see a bunch of non-creature permanents, which are both artifacts and enchantments, and have control elements. And then a smattering of spells, which mostly draw cards or kill creatures. In fact, looking at the artifacts for a moment, it looks like I should have probably given this deck a nod in Sahili's video, because there are quite a few good ones, not just Solaring. And uh, four of the best win conditions in the deck are artifact creatures. Back to Amanato, let's have a look at the creature comparison. You can see there's a uh, distinct similarity between the creature curves, with half of the creatures being above five drops, although that's fairly typical for commander decks. The real focus of the deck is the life gain sub-theme, or theme, rather. Alora himself gains you life every turn, you've got plenty of lifelink creatures, we've got repeatable life gain sources, and then a few valuable one-offs like Survival Cash or Azorius Herald. And then, of course, there are the cards that cared about how much life you have, like Sarah Avatar or Divinity of Pride. And then there are the cards that care about gaining life, such as the Johnny's Pride Mate or Well of Lost Dreams. Finally, there are plenty of very potent spells which cost life as an additional cost. So you get pretty big effects with the cost of paying life in addition to any mana costs. Toxic Deluge lets you pay X life to give all creatures minus X minus X. Uh, Reckless Spite destroys two non-black creatures, but you lose five life. 
Greed lets you pay a black and two life to draw a card, which when you're gaining two life every turn, you can just turn that right into pay a black, draw a card. And then there was a spicy reprint, Lim Duel's Vault, which lets you look at the top five cards of your library, and as many times as you choose, you can pay one life and put those on the bottom, and then look at the top five again, and put them in any order. So it really lets you select what you need to win the game in the situation you're in. And that's really Alaro. So looking at the deck side by side, there are similarities, there's differences. I think I like the look of Aminato's a little better. Again, it's a newer design aesthetic. It's um, more exciting probably because I've played the Aloro deck a lot. But uh, they do completely different things, so it's interesting to see in the same colors, in the same format, really how much diversity there is. And that's it for this week, so let me know what you thought in the comments down below, and make sure you come back for next week when we'll be rounding off the series with Nature's Vengeance, helmed by Lord Windgrace himself. So thanks very much for watching, and uh, see you next time.